All right, welcome to the first Sunday of Advent, and we're glad that you're joining us as we journey toward Christmas. The word Advent is a version of a Latin term that means what? Who knows? What's Advent mean? Coming. Coming. That's why you have the first Advent and you have the second Advent, all right? In fact, in our Wednesday night Bible study, except for this week when we'll allow our people to go Christmas caroling, all right? Uh, we've had several folks express an interest in that, so we'll be doing that uh, Wednesday night, all right? Advent is the word for coming. Some churches talk more about Advent than other churches. It doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is that you prepare yourself for the coming of Christ. So we're going to use these weeks leading up to Christmas as a chance to look forward to our celebration of the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, the light of the world. Advent's a season of great expectation. And we are on a journey, and it's an epic journey that began more than 2,000 years ago. We're going to follow the star and discover the light of the world. That's a journey that will help us to explore the gifts of Christmas that are delivered through Christ, gifts of hope, love, joy, and peace. Everybody needs hope in the storms of life. Everybody needs a love that never gives up, fresh joy for the journey, and peace, no matter what we're facing or dealing with. Now, this journey and the series that we're doing today for the next five services, counting today's through Christmas Eve, kind of centers on the star as our guiding light. The star of Bethlehem has taken a central place in the Christmas story, but as you know, it's not mentioned a lot. How many Gospels mention the star of Bethlehem? How many? I'll take away that, as you know, that I just said that. Uh, one. One. The record of wise men from the East who followed a star is only mentioned in Matthew's Gospel, that account of Christ's coming. And uh, perhaps in the last Wednesday night that I have as a Bible, in a Bible study, I will share with you where I believe the wise men from the East, how did they even know to look for a star? I think they knew because there was a guy named Daniel that was the head wise man. Daniel was. In fact, I preached a whole sermon on this back probably 10, 15 years ago. And I still remember it. I'm not going to preach it here today. But Wednesday night, a couple of Wednesday nights from now, when I finish the, the prophecy series on the two Advents, the prophecies about the Advents, I'll, I'll deal with that. Why we believe the wise men knew about it from Daniel. But even though it's not there in the Gospels a lot, the star then and now is a guide that ultimately leads us to Jesus, who is the light of the world. So as we continue this journey on this Advent season, I, and it's a spiritual journey I'm talking to you about right now, even though the wise men took a long physical journey, I would like to encourage all of us to look for the light. The Advent season is about the journey as much as the destination, so it's a time to prepare, to pause, to ponder, to breathe deeply and turn our eyes to the true meaning of this time each year. Now, let me just share something with you. A lot of people get all bent out of shape about the world's commercialization of Christmas and all that. Well, you can either curse the darkness or you can light a candle. So instead of cursing the darkness, I choose to light a candle. I choose to as much as possible Give people the light, Jesus Christ. Now, I know it's hectic. I know it's a time of the year that can seem hectic and stressful in our culture. Well, think about the people who were part of that first Christmas. Mary, Joseph, 
an innkeeper, jealous king named Herod, some wise men, some common shepherds, some angels, and so on. While the pace of our lives would probably make their heads spin, each of these people were facing daily difficulties that you and I would want no part with. See, they didn't have all the answers. They had not spent hours getting ready. They were not prepared for the supernatural journey and events that were awaiting them. They didn't have any clue. They didn't know what was about to happen. They didn't even understand all the time, even when the angels appeared or a star guided their path. But they all answered God's invitation to come and see the arrival of his son. They said, yes. Will you say yes to the journey? Will you peer through the darkness of your life, no matter what that may be, and look for the glimmer of hope? Will you step toward the light, even if your vision seems cloudy? Now, in your bulletin, you have an outline. I invite you to take the bulletin and open it up because we're talking about how to follow the star on a journey of hope. Don't think that it's not possible. If your Christmas season already seems overwhelmed by any number of struggles, financial stressors, family dysfunctions, memories of loss, commercialized expectations, everybody's been there at some time or another, but let me share with you that the light of the world, Jesus Christ, shines hope brightly as we follow the star. Now, here's three things that we're going to look at today to help us to go on this journey of hope, all right? First one is, number one, acknowledge the darkness. Acknowledge the darkness. Now, Here's a flashlight, and with the lights on, you don't see it very well. But when we turn the lights off, yeah, that's bright, isn't it? See, in the, in the light, it doesn't shine. But in the darkness, even though we, this room is not totally dark, if this dark room was pitch black dark, this light would really, really appear super, super bright. All right, go ahead and turn the lights back on. I apologize for whoever's eyes I shined that light into. But you got the message, didn't you? You got the point. When we're surrounded by darkness, you saw how much light, just a little tiny tactical flashlight put off. It's kind of amazing that God chose a star to guide the wise men to Bethlehem. Throughout the Bible, we see how God uses his creation to reveal himself to us. Psalm 19, for example, 1 to 4, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the world, their words to the ends of the world. In Psalm 8, the psalmist said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have made, what is man that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. God's glory is seen in the stars. Now, you know the thing about stars? You have to be to able to see the stars best. You have to be where it's the darkest. You don't see stars very well surrounded by the lights of any city. When you're in a city and there's street lights and everything else and all the neon, and you don't see the stars very well. They're there, but you can't see them. The darker the night, the brighter the stars shine. And this time of year, holiday glitz can actually kind of artificially light people's lives. Or we might seek out our own flashing distractions to try to distract us. But facing the darkness and calling it what it is allows us to see the true light. And so I would suggest that the first thing that we do on our journey of hope is to acknowledge the darkness. Here's two scriptures. Talk about the human heart. And darkness. Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wicked 
is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Proverbs 4.19. Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The world's full of darkness. Spiritual darkness. And let me just say a word about all the sexual harassment stories that have hit the news in the past week. You say, what's he going to say about that? Stay tuned. Here it is. I can give you the explanation. It's a sad one, but it's one that a lot of people don't understand. You see that scripture? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. While you and I can be saddened by the stories of people falling from grace, from their positions of power, if I were you, I would not let yourself be too shocked. And I don't mean that we don't hate sin. We ought to hate sin, all right? And we don't, we don't, I'm not, this is, what I'm giving you now is not a justification. It's an explanation. And it's this fact, even though you and I don't like to admit it, any human being is capable of any sin, even murder, in the right circumstances, or wrong, shall we say, circumstances, okay? Now, see, we don't like, we, we always think we're better than whoever we're casting stones at, don't we? We're not. See, our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. And the human heart, in fact, I can, without, this is not on the PowerPoint, but here it is. You remember when God sent a universal flood to destroy the world? You, you know why he did that? What's the Bible say in Genesis? It says this. I'll quote it. I'll paraphrase, quote it. It says, God looked down and saw that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil what? What's the last word? Continually. God saw. And then Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so Noah was spared. He had, was told to build the ark. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. While Noah was righteous in comparison to the rest of the world, even Noah wasn't without sin, and after the flood and after the ark, there was all kinds of trouble with Noah and his family, right? He got drunk. And on it went. And see, what God did not do, God did not start over and make a new human race, did he, after the flood? He destroyed the world because every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Guess what? We're there again. We're there. And I'm not glad about that, but that's where we're at today, folks. That's why every kind of immorality that 50 years ago you would have been shocked to hear people talk about is now openly practiced, and our society says it's okay. And see, we have reaped the results of the whole 60s free drug, sex, and rock and roll movement. You say, well, those people ought to know better. Oh, absolutely they should. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The best thing you and I could do is to stay close to God. Because the scripture says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So I pray every day for myself. And you should pray for me. You should pray for other church leaders. Because the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom may devour. And my prayer for myself, for my wife, for my sons, I pray for God to put a hedge of thorns around us to cover us with the blood of Christ and protect us from the evil one who wants to destroy our family. He wants to destroy your family too. Now again, I'm not meaning to be some doomsday prophet or whatever this might sound like to people who aren't used to Bible preaching, but folks, we are living in the last days and the perilous times are upon us and that's why we need to acknowledge the darkness and recognize how dark it is. Now, you don't get in despair about that. What you do is determine, I'm going to make sure I know Jesus Christ, the light of the world, 
And then I'm going to allow him to shine into my life and shine out through me to other people. And do not allow yourself to be silenced because you once were like they are. So a lot of Christians do that. They say, well, I, you know, I don't want to witness because people are going to throw it back at me and say, well, what, about, what are you doing preaching to me? All you got to do is say this. Yeah, that's once I was lost, now I'm found. Once I was blind, now I can see. And I'm not testifying about me, you can say. I'm testifying about Jesus and what he did for me. Acknowledge the darkness. The people are walking in darkness, Isaiah said, have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light is dawned, Isaiah 9, 2. That's why Jesus was prophesied. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel, God with us, Isaiah 7, 14. Both of those verses in Isaiah were spoken long before Christ was born. You see, the people of Israel lived in that space between promise and fulfillment. Looking back, it's easy for us to see how the first Passover, when God spared the firstborns of the Israelites in Egypt and set them free from slavery, it's easy for us looking back to see how that foreshadowed the coming of Jesus, the Passover lamb, but the people of Israel didn't have the benefit of hindsight. They were desperate for a deliverer. Many of them thought God had forgotten them, especially as they lived in Jesus' time under Roman oppression there in the time of Herod. A lot of people today feel the same way. Many today share that common experience of darkness and desperation. Nothing can rec- rescue us except God. And the beauty of the journey of hope is that we see in what seems to be the darkest hour, God shows up. That's why I say we can find and continue to draw hope knowing that Jesus entered our darkness that first Christmas. He came, watch this, John 8, 12. It's not on the PowerPoint, but I have it memorized and you should have it marked in your Bible. You know what Jesus came and said in John 8, 12? I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not, watch this, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Open your Bible to John 1. I'm going to show you something about the light, okay? John 1. In John 1, we have the prophecy of Jesus Christ, the Word. In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus, the Logos. The Word was with God. The Word was God. By the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't like that verse in the Bible. They've changed it. They've messed it all up. They mongrelized that verse. Yeah. John 1.1. 1, 1. You say, why did they do that? Because it says that Jesus is God. They don't believe that Jesus is God, see? They say he's a God, small g. New World Translation of the Bible. Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now watch verse 4. By the way, in John 1, you have the deity of Christ, the eternity of Christ. You have Christ as creator. Now watch this about the light. And this is good to see. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now verse 4, watch. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Light, I have this note to myself, light always overcomes the darkness. Always. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And then it goes on to talk about John the Baptist who came, and he was, was here sent to, to shine on the light, to, to proclaim the light. Now, let me just share with you quickly. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you won't walk in darkness, he wasn't talking about physical darkness because that's outside. He was talking about the darkness of sin, okay? So when you follow Jesus Christ, 
and you allow him to come into your life and forgive your sin, then he says you don't have to walk in the darkness of sin anymore. You can have the light of life. And so when you acknowledge the darkness, then turn to the light, Jesus. Make sure that you know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. And then make sure that you're living your life in light of this book, the Word. See, we have the, the living Word, Jesus, and the written Word, the Bible. And I'll show you as I close the message today how you can fan the flames of hope in your life. There's only one way. It's through the Scriptures. See, Paul said, we through the comfort of the Scriptures can have hope. Romans 15, 4. Now, if you follow cable news and you read the Sunday paper, you're not going to have much hope. And by the way, do you, know, do you realize that one year from now, everything that the cable news people say today won't matter one iota? It will not. But everything that God says will matter for eternity. Acknowledge the darkness. Turn to Jesus. Recognize that he's the light of the world. Recognize that no matter how dark the night, the brighter the light shines. And recognize that light always overcomes the darkness. Number two, this is the hard one. Embrace the weight. On the journey of hope, what we need to do is embrace the waiting. Who likes waiting here? Does anybody like waiting here this morning? Raise your hand if you like waiting. You can go to confession for lying after the service. <laughs> kidding, just kidding. Right. Don't confess your sins to me. Confess them to the Lord. First John 1, 9. That's who I confess to. We live in a culture that does everything possible to reduce the amount of time we spend waiting, doesn't it? We wouldn't do very well living in the days of the Israelites. People of Israel in the Bible knew all about the long wait. Since Genesis, in the very first book of the Bible, when sin entered the world, we see God offered the promise of hope. Genesis 3.15. God said that the seed of the woman, that's the virgin birth. That's, by the way, the first prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus is right there, Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman would bruise the head of Satan. That's why, by the way, the children of Israel, the Jews, have been persecuted down through the centuries because Satan was trying to kill the seed through which Messiah would come. That's why both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Jews were persecuted. Satan was trying to kill Jesus. He was trying to kill Jesus before he was even born. However, of course, we, you and I are privileged to have the Bible and hindsight to look backwards. The Jews did not. See, they, they were waiting and waiting and waiting for Messiah. And the waiting seemed like forever. Imagine this image for yourself. Imagine a farmer standing on the dry dust of a parched field and looking up to the sky. Years of drought have taken everything from him, and he has lost hope. But then in the distance, he hears the rumble of thunder, the promise of rain. That's the image that John the Baptist gave of himself when people asked if he was the Messiah. He said, no, I'm not, but I'm announcing the arrival of the long-awaited one. He was the herald of hope. I like the way the message puts it in John 1.23. You know what John the Baptist says in John 1.23, John the message? I'm thunder in the desert. Make the road straight for God. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. John says, hey, I'm the thunder in the desert. See? I'm the hope that the rain's coming to overcome the drought. Advent's a time of waiting. And while it feels unnatural, there is a benefit in embracing this season as we anticipate the coming of Jesus. The waiting reminds us of where our hope is set. 
it allows us the time and focus to hear the distant rumble of thunder, the promise that our hope will be fulfilled. And while we wait to celebrate Jesus' birth, we also wait for our true hope to be fulfilled when Jesus comes in the second advent, when he comes again. That'll be the ultimate fulfillment of our deepest hopes. The Apostle John described it this way in Revelation, Revelation 7, 9, 16, and 17. After this I looked, John says, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They will hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 7, 16 and 17. Now, you and I still live in the space between the present and fulfillment, the not yet. So our challenge is to embrace. See, people wait, but they don't embrace it. Embrace the waiting with hope. That's our challenge. And then you allow that hope to carry you through the weight. You see, you could say that hope fuels our very faith. It draws us onward, giving us expectation that our belief and longing will be fulfilled like God promised. In fact, Hebrews 11.1 says what? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So allow this Advent season to serve as a reminder of the confidence we have as we wait in hope for what we do not yet see. Seek the light of the star no matter how faintly it might first appear to you and draw hope from its growing light. And then number three, we go on this journey of hope by committing to the journey. Commit to the journey. Now, I don't know about you, but my natural images of waiting and journeying are different. One involves sitting around, one involves moving. But the concept of waiting throughout the Bible is one of active waiting. Think about those words. Active waiting. We wait with expectant hearts, but we are constantly moving forward on our journey. Now, I didn't put the big idea on your bulletin and I didn't I is it on the bulletin no but I want you to write down right now here's the big idea for this message the hope that God gives involves active waiting that's the big idea for the message there it is on the screen I, I went past it I didn't mention it at the beginning the hope that God gives involves active waiting. Now you say, well, what is active waiting, Pastor Bill? Well, let me read, read a definition to you that I think will help to explain it. Professor, writer, and theologian Henry Nguyen described the waiting we see in Scripture as very active. In Waiting for God, he wrote this. This is what he wrote, quote, Active waiting means to be present fully to the moment in the conviction that something is happening where you are and that you want to be present to it. In fact, when, when our little guy was growing up, he didn't like to wait. So you know what we had a saying in our family for this hyperactive little guy that didn't like to wait? Here's what it was. Say what? It fits right here. Savor the moment. <laughs> Savor the moment. Because they always wanted to know, know what was going to happen, you know, in the next in five hours, or three hours. Whatever. Savor the moment. Be present in the moment. Actively wait. Embrace the wait. That's an excellent description of Advent. And it's not easy. It takes strength and courage. But we can draw from the source of our hope. As the psalmist said in Psalm 31, 24, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. You know what you should do with the Psalms, among many other things that you find there? You find the word wait a lot in Psalms, but you also find the word hope. 
and I've I've gotten a lots of, lots of great great blessing for my own self in circling and underlining every time you find the word wait in the Psalms and you find the word hope. Yeah, hope. Because if you don't have any hope, it's hard to wait. But when your hope's in the Lord, then you can embrace the wait. You can commit to the journey. And here's what it looks like in real life. 1 Peter 1.13. This is the verse I chose as the text. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope. Now, the King James says it like this, and I, I like this word. The King James says, with minds that are alert and fully sober, rest your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Rest your hope. Rest it. What's that imply? That implies that you're not anxious. You can't rest when you're anxious, can you? That's why the Bible says be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's last week's message. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Rest your hope. You see, hope is about waiting, but that waiting involves a commitment to being present in our journey of obedience, alert, sober. Those are words of expectation and active anticipation. The good news in all this is that wherever you are on your journey, it's okay. God understands. Just keep following the light. Now, we have four weeks of Advent that lead to Christmas, but that's a human-created calendar timing, not God's timing. Advent is about a deadline to have to get prepared by. It's not about finding all the answers or checking all the boxes. It's about preparing your heart. You just have to show up and be willing to follow God's lead wherever you are. You are not too late. God's timing is perfect. And God wants to fill your heart with hope for the ultimate healing and life in his son. I love the scriptures of Hebrews 10, 35 to 37. Watch what they say. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now, so you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all he has promised. Or watch this. For in just a little while, the coming one, that's Advent, the coming one will come and not delay. Let me tell you when I know Jesus Christ is coming back. When I know he's coming back. He's coming back on God's timetable. He's never early, but he's also never late. He's never late. God will always show up just in time. You say, well, Pastor Bo, it's hard. It's hard to hang on to hope. That's why you need the scripture. Romans 15, 4. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him. As you trust him. I have a question. Do you trust him? I'm not talking just about for your salvation. Probably 95% of the people here at this point say, oh yeah, I, I accepted Jesus as my savior years ago. That's good. What I'm asking you is, you, do you trust him every day? You trust him not only for the big things, but for the little things. I was talking to a lady this past week. She said, was saying she didn't like to bother God with her troubles because there was a lot of people she, she knew that had a whole lot worse troubles than her, a lot bigger problem. I said, no, I'm sorry, you're wrong. She looked at me. I said, I'm not minimizing your troubles and I'm not magnifying them, but I'm just telling you this. For God, for God, 
there are no big troubles. For God, there are no big problems. For God, there are no big situations. They're all the same to him. <laughs> so you can trust him. And know that he'll always show up on time and always keep his word, always do what he said. Let's bow our heads and hearts for a moment of silence before we pray. Now, maybe you've not yet trusted Jesus Christ, the light of the world, as your personal Savior. Maybe you've not yet done that. So you don't have the assurance that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. You don't have the assurance of a guaranteed reservation in heaven. But you say, Pastor, I'd like to have that. I'd like to have that assurance. All right, then let me ask you, invite you to pray with me right now, just quietly there in your seat, from your heart of hearts to God. Pray this prayer with me. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to be the light of the world. Thank you that the promised one came the first time, was born as a baby in Bethlehem, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for my sins. I believe that, and I ask him now to come into my life. I believe that Jesus not only died for my sins, I believe he rose from the grave, and he offers me eternal life if I'll ask for it. So I ask today, for you to change my heart and life. Give me eternal life and a guaranteed reservation to heaven. Help me now to share the hope of the gospel with others as I've accepted it today. In Jesus' name I pray. While their heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer a minute, God heard you and gave you eternal life. I'd like to thank him for doing that. If you'll let me, if you would, would you lift your hand right now? If you prayed that prayer with me a moment ago, never did before, but you prayed it today. As I said, I hope. And it's possible that everybody here has already done that. And so let me ask you to do this. Is there someone that you know that needs to put their faith and trust in Jesus? And perhaps you could be the one that God would use at this Advent season to give them an invitation to come to the light of the world, Jesus. I invite you to tell God today that with his help, you'll give an invitation to a Christmas service. You'll give a gospel track. You'll put something in your Christmas cards about Jesus. You'll do something to share the light of the world, Jesus, with people who are in darkness. If you're willing to do that, you'd say, Pastor Bill, pray for me that I'll do that this holiday season as I wait for Advent, wait for Christmas. Would you lift your hand with me right now? Many hands raised. Thank you. God bless. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your patience, your long suffering. Help us to not lose hope, no matter how sinful the world gets, to not lose hope. Help us to recognize that in the midst of great darkness, great, there's great need for light. And Jesus can shine that much more brightly if we'll let him shine through us. He's back in heaven now, but he put us here. He said, you are the light of the world. Help us to let our light shine so people would see how we're living and glorify you because we tell them it's because of Jesus. Give you praise and thanks for what you're going to do and ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.